This episode was suggested by a listener, Aaron, via our website. If you'd like to suggest a topic or just say hi, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, or on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. Before we begin this episode, I want to warn you that we will be discussing several violent and brutal murders, not only of adults, but also children. If that isn't something you're comfortable hearing about, this might be a good episode to skip. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. The process we know today as forensic investigation, or crime scene investigation, is a relatively new institution. The ability to identify a criminal based on their fingerprints, DNA, systematic analysis of a crime scene, and blood typing is amazing and incredibly useful in solving difficult cases. We take forensics for granted, especially when we look back on historic unsolved murders. We can't quite understand why the murderer wasn't caught, or why modern forensics applied to old data still cannot solve the case. One of the most famous unsolved cases in America was the brutal murder of an entire family in Iowa in 1912 by an unknown killer wielding an axe. No one saw anything. No one heard anything. The murderer was never caught. This is the case of the Velisca Axe Murders. In 1912, the town of Velisca, Iowa was one of about 2,000 people. At the time, it was actually considered a city. It was known as a pleasant place, with no saloons and three train lines connecting it to the rest of the country. The Moors were a large family that lived in this prosperous yet sleepy town. Josiah Moore, or J.B. to his friends, was said to be a cheerful, well-liked man who was generally at peace with everyone. He and his wife Sarah had four children, Herman, age 11, Mary Catherine, or just Catherine, age 10, Arthur, age seven, and Paul, age five. The Moore family was well known in the community as J.B. owned the local John Deere farm implements franchise. Overall, the Moore family was doing moderately well for themselves. On Sunday evening, June 19, 1912, J.B., Sarah, and the whole Moore family left their home at 8 p.m. to attend a children's day service at their Presbyterian church. The service had been put together by several congregation members, including Sarah Moore. The Moores attended the service with two friends, Ina and Lena Stillinger, age 8 and 12 respectively, who were visiting their grandmother in town and had been playing at the Moore house all day. The street lights in town were all out thanks to a disagreement between the city and the electric company. So after the service was over, Ina and Lena planned to go home with the Moore family being too afraid to walk back to their grandmother's house alone in the pitch darkness. JB had called earlier in the day to make sure this was all right with Lena and Ina's parents. Their older sister, Blanche, gave permission, so the Moore family and the two Stillinger girls returned to the Moore home between 9.45 and 10 p.m. The next morning, Mary Peckham, the Moore's next-door neighbor, woke up at 5 a.m. and began her Monday morning chores. She was surprised by how quiet the usually bustling Moore house was, but got on with her own work. By 7 a.m., however, she was worried. The Moore house was still silent and dark. 
Usually, JB got up early to feed his horses, cows, and chickens before going to work, but that day, the chickens were still squawking loudly in their coop. Mary knocked on the front door, but there was no answer. When she tried to open it, she found it locked. She went to let the chickens out and returned home to call JB's brother, Ross, wondering if the family had gone to visit JB and Ross's parents. Ross told her they hadn't. Mary then called JB's store where she spoke to his employee, Ed Selly. Ed said JB wasn't there either, which was unusual. Ed went to the Moore house to feed the animals and then returned to the store. Ross also turned up, and with Mary looking on, he knocked on all the doors and windows, calling to his brother's family. But there was still no answer. Finally, around 8 a.m., he used his own key to the house to unlock the front door. Inside, it was completely dark and completely silent. All the shades were drawn, but from the light of the doorway, nothing seemed out of place in the front parlor. Ross decided to check the downstairs bedroom, usually occupied by Mary Catherine. When he opened the door, a horrific sight met his eyes. Blood was spattered across the bedspread, and the shape of an arm was poking out from underneath the covers. Ross fled back to the front porch, where Mary was waiting nervously. All he said was something terrible has happened. Ross told Mary to call Marshal Hank Horton, Velisca's primary peace officer. The Velisca police force was made up of Marshal Horton and two night watchmen. None of them had official police officer training. The main police force and the county sheriff were located in Red Oak, a town about 18 miles away. Marshal Horton soon arrived at the scene and cautiously searched the house, worried the killer could still be found inside. Armed with only his baton, he used matches to light his search, as none of the window shades were open and the house had no electricity. In the downstairs bedroom, he found the bodies of two young girls, both in bed with their heads bludgeoned in covered in a blanket. He didn't recognize either of them, but he did see a rusty axe leaning up against the wall and a bloodied piece of clothing that had been used to wipe it clean on the floor. A kerosene lamp without its chimney and a pound of bacon wrapped in a towel were also on the floor. Up the creaking staircase, he found J.B. and Sarah Moore, also in bed with their heads bludgeoned in and covered over with clothing and blankets. A second kerosene lamp without a chimney sat on the floor of their room. In the last bedroom, Horton found the bodies of four more children, all of them in bed with their heads bludgeoned in. As he made his way back out of the house, Horton noticed that all the windows had been covered up with clothing and sheets. All of the mirrors, too, were covered. A bowl of bloody water sat on the kitchen table, as if the killer had sat down to wash his hands after killing everyone in the house. When Horton came out the front door, a crowd of neighbors had gathered. He pulled the door shut behind him and told Ross what he'd seen. He also pulled one of the night watchmen onto the porch and told him not to let anyone else in the house. Then Horton ran to find the local doctor, Dr. Cooper, at his office. He also went to City Hall to call the sheriff in Red Oak. Then Horton and Cooper returned to the Moore house just before 9 a.m. The crowd had grown in Horton's absence. Marshal Horton took Dr. Cooper through the house, letting him peer under the clothing and sheets that covered the faces of the dead. From their wounds, Dr. Cooper believed they had been bludgeoned to death with the blunt end of an axe sometime between midnight and 5 a.m. J.B. had been hit the most. Lena may have awoken and tried to squirm away before she died. This was indicated by her body position half off the bed. Her nightdress was also pushed up to her waist and her underwear was on the floor, having been used to wipe the axe clean. The bacon on the floor of the downstairs bedroom may have been used as a lubricant for masturbation. 
Marshall Horton went back to City Hall to call a private detective he knew named Thomas O'Leary of the Kirk Detective Agency. At this time, private detectives were often used more than official police officers to solve crimes. They had better training and were more often available. Horton also called the county attorney, the county coroner, and a few other local doctors. He also called the National Guard and instructed them to bring bloodhounds to the Moore House. Although Horton had instructed the watchmen not to let anyone into the Moore House, the watchmen did not zealously enforce this order. By the time the National Guard got to Villisca around noon, it's estimated that 20 people had already been through the house. A local drugstore owner had brought his camera, hoping to help the investigation with crime scene photos, but he was turned away shortly after he arrived. Only one possible authentic photo still exists from this case, and it only shows a dresser on which a mirror is perched, covered in what looks like a woman's skirt, pulled from the dresser below. It's not known if this photo is legitimate, however. Horton asked everyone who had gone through the house what they had seen, and wrote it down. He asked the crowd if they had seen any suspicious strangers the night before. No one had seen anything unusual. Horton then rallied some volunteers to check the outbuildings, like barns and sheds, all over the town for evidence of someone hiding out. They found nothing, except an indentation in the Moore's barn where someone might have lay the previous day. The bloodhounds arrived in Villisca at 9 p.m. that evening. They caught a scent and followed it to the edge of town, followed in turn by a horde of people. The trail went cold at the bank of the Nottoway Creek, near the spot where it went under the railroad tracks. The bloodhounds were used again the following Tuesday morning and traced the same trail, but again they were unable to pick it up on the other side of the creek. The coroner's jury also went through the house on Tuesday, making notes on the crime scene. Late that night, the bodies of the Moore family and the two Stillinger girls were removed from the house and taken to a makeshift morgue at the Villisca fire station. The coroner's jury also began hearing testimony on Tuesday after going through the house. These testimonies were properly recorded and included statements from Mary Peckham, Dr. Cooper, Marshall Horton, Ross Moore and three of his brothers, Fenwick, Harry, and Charles, Ross Moore's wife, Jessie, Ed Selly, Dr. Williams, who also examined the bodies, Edward Landers, a neighbor, Blanche Stillinger, and her father, Joseph. No one seemed to have noticed anything, except Landers, who thought perhaps he had heard someone whooping at regular intervals around 11 p.m. Sunday night. Only after he heard about the murders did he think anything of it. No one could think of anybody who would want to hurt the Moore family. The crowds that had stood outside the house on the day the tragedy had been discovered were mostly local people, neighbors, relatives, and friends of the Moors. In the days that followed, the news spread by word of mouth and the crowds swelled. Reporters, People from out of town who were drawn by the spectacle and dozens of private detectives all came to Villisca to hear more about the murders. It's estimated that 7,000 people attended the burial and funeral service held for the Moore family and the two Stillinger girls the Wednesday after their deaths. Thus far, what I have told you is all fact, derived from evidence found at the scene of the crime and recorded in witness testimonies in the two days following the brutal and tragic murders of J.B., Sarah, Herman, Mary Catherine, Arthur, and Paul Moore, and Ina and Lena Stillinger. Their deaths at the hands of an unknown killer seemed like a random, senseless act of extreme violence. Their lives were cut incredibly short. The town of Villisca was never the same again. The people who lived there no longer felt safe. Neighbor suspected neighbor, and soon the whole population would turn against one another as the case remained unsolved. There were several theories at the time as to what might have happened and who might have done it. There were even more theories in the years that followed. Before I tell you about these theories, however, let's take a break and have a word from our sponsors. 
Our regular sponsor is Audible.com. If you're too busy to read but have time to listen, Audible.com can provide you with interesting and engaging audiobooks. In fact, there are over 180,000 of them to choose from, which you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 player. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible.com by going to audibletrial.com slash mcp. You can find this link on our Facebook page and website. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, even if you cancel the service. And the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. That's www.audibletrial.com slash mcp. Our other sponsor is Think Geek, the premier retailer for the global geek community. Express your love of Fallout, Harry Potter, Jurassic Park, Bob's Burgers, and so much more with clever t-shirts and other unique apparel, home and office decor, electronics, collectibles, and more. Think Geek has great gifts whether you're into science or science fiction, and many of the items you won't find anywhere else, such as their adorable collection of plushy microbes. Just follow our link, bit.ly slash morbidgeek, to search their massive collection. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash morbidgeek to get your geek on. Lastly, if you like this podcast, why not support or sponsor the MCP yourself by way of a donation? It takes a lot of time to research, write, record, and edit this show, all while keeping it free for you, the listener. When you donate, it helps us pay for research materials, and it keeps the lights on and the show free. If more people donate, we may even be able to eliminate the need for sponsors. That would mean no break in the middle of the show. If you'd like to help us out, head over to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and click the Donate button. You can make a one-time donation or set up a monthly donation if you're feeling extra generous. Just $5 a month helps us out a lot, and it probably costs less than a large latte at your favorite coffee shop. In fact, it would be just like buying me a coffee once a month. I'd love to do this show for a living, and your donations, especially monthly ones, can help make that dream a reality. We'll also soon be setting up a Patreon account, and I'll keep you up to date for when we launch. I really, really, really appreciate your support. And now, back to the podcast. As I mentioned, the witnesses present at the coroner's hearing had no idea who would want to hurt the Moore family. The county sheriff, Oren Jackson, believed someone from outside of town had done it, either with an unknown grudge against J.B. Moore or that the Moore house was selected randomly for a psychotic killing spree. The small town was connected to the rest of the world by the railway, and it was very possible the murder had come and gone that way. However, the people of Villisca were terrified, panicked, and wanted to see justice done. Therefore, accusations within the town soon became rampant. Some wondered if J.B.'s old employer, Frank Jones, might have had a grudge against J.B. for leaving Jones's business and starting his own. Jones was a state senator at the time and doing well with his own business. There was no real evidence he disliked J.B., or was even truly angry with him for leaving the business. However, the suspicions surrounding Jones grew with the appearance of James Wilkerson, a private detective from the Burns Agency of Kansas City. Wilkerson was intelligent, charming, and stubborn. He saw Jones as a whale, someone he could blackmail for a large sum in order to remove him from the suspects list. It's possible Wilkerson truly believed Jones had a hand in the murder, but it's far more likely that he was looking to make money from the case, and Jones was the most profitable suspect. Either way, Wilkerson began investigating Jones as soon as he showed up in Villisca, two years after the murders. The Burns Agency, which Wilkerson was tied to, had been contacted directly after the murders, and they had sent Detective C.W. Toby to Villisca undercover to root out a suspect. Toby had worked the case until August 1912, consistently filing reports with the agency. In September, he was promoted and handed the case over to Detective W.S. Gordon. Gordon preferred to work out in the open and often spoke to the papers about what was being done to solve the case. However, by the winter of 1912, 
The Burns Agency had run out of leads, and Gordon gave up the case, leaving Wilkerson to pick it up two years later. There were other detectives working on the Velisca case at the same time. Special Agent M. W. McClory was a federal officer assigned to the case. He was part of the Department of Justice Bureau of Criminal Investigation, a government body that later became the FBI. McClory became interested in the Velisca case while working to solve several similar cases, but I'll get to that in a moment. Despite all the good detective work, there were still few leads, and it seemed as if nothing was being done. Enter James Wilkerson and his ambitions to prosecute Senator Frank Jones. Wilkerson was persistent. He told Jones that he had the evidence to convict him, despite the fact that Wilkerson really had nothing. He also said Jones could buy the evidence for $25,000, which amounts to around $600,000 in today's currency. This was obviously blackmail and extortion, and Jones refused to pay. He knew he was innocent. Wilkerson tried to get Jones arrested for years, interviewing people and manipulating them into believing they had seen something other than what they had already told the police at the time of the murders. To the people of Villisca, it seemed like Wilkerson was the only person doing something about the case, so many people, including the relatives of the Moors, supported him. Other people believed Jones was innocent and the victim of libel. The citizens of Villisca were at odds with one another, split by who they supported. In July 1914, another family was murdered in Blue Island, Illinois. William Mansfield, an army deserter and slaughterhouse worker, was suspected of murdering his wife, infant child, father-in-law, and mother-in-law with an axe. Wilkerson pounced on this new information, saying Jones had hired Mansfield to kill the Moors. But Mansfield protested that he hadn't. He even had an alibi that placed him in Illinois at the time of the Velisca murders. However, a restaurant owner said that he thought he saw Mansfield in Velisca the morning after the murders, but this was never proven, and his statement may have been due to Wilkerson's manipulation. Even so, Wilkerson spread flyers all over Velisca with pictures of Mansfield's face next to Jones's, adding the made-up nickname Blackie to Mansfield's name. Mansfield sued Wilkerson and won. Jones lost his re-election, but filed his own suit against Wilkerson, eventually revealing many illegal actions taken by Wilkerson in his attempts to convict Jones. Wilkerson's case was thrown out, and he was fired from the Burns Agency in 1917. Jones had won, but the question of who had murdered the Moors was still unsolved. Another suspect was Reverend L. J. G. Kelly. Kelly was described as a weakling and a pervert, having been caught peering in women's windows. At the time of the murders, Kelly was in divinity school and staying with the Presbyterian minister of Felisca in order to attend and observe the Children's Day service. He left Felisca by train around 5 a.m. on the morning the bodies were found. As soon as he heard about the murders, he became obsessed with them. He even pretended to be a detective in order to get into the Moore house and look around years after the crime. He wrote to Detective Toby to see if he could be of use. Sheriff Jackson and the Villisca County attorney interviewed Kelly around the time of the murders and dismissed him, as he had an alibi for the night in question and was too weak to have done the damage that was caused to the bodies. In early 1914, Kelly was arrested for sending salacious letters and confined to a mental institution in Washington, D.C. for several months. There, he annoyed the other patients with his talk of Velisca. Eventually, one of his supervisors reported that Kelly had confessed to the murders. Sheriff Jackson went to question Kelly again, and Kelly denied having said he killed the Moors. He gave a statement that was consistent with the one he had given previously. He was later released, but the press heard about his confession. Kelly's accusation became wrapped up in Wilkerson's web of deception, and he was coerced into confessing. However, his confession did not match what had occurred at the crime scene, and was later retracted. Even so, Kelly was tried twice for the murders. He was eventually acquitted. The final suspect I'll talk about was Henry L. Moore, no relation to the Moors of Villisca. Moore was convicted of the murder of his grandmother and mother in Columbia, Missouri, 
just months after the Velisca murders occurred. He had worked on the railroad between jail sentences and was living with the two women at the time they were killed. He had used an axe to bludgeon them to death and later asked a neighbor to accompany him to the crime scene, pretending to be worried about the women. It's possible he was even copying the method used in Velisca with hopes of avoiding arrest. He was, however, arrested and confessed to killing his mother and grandmother in order to get their house and money. Agent McClary suspected Moore was also responsible for the Velisca murders, as well as 22 other axe murders which had occurred around the Midwestern United States around the same time. These murders were in various states and varying years, but the modus operandi, or method, of the killings was incredibly similar. The first occurred in Colorado Springs in September of 1911. Two families that lived next door to one another, a total of six victims, were murdered in their beds, bludgeoned to death as they slept. Their homes were locked, and all the window shades had been drawn, and clothes were heaped onto the bodies. The axe that was used was left at the scene, and it didn't appear that anything had been taken, except the lives of those that were killed. A fingerprint was discovered, but its owner was never found. The next case happened about a week later in Monmouth, Illinois. A family of three was killed as they slept, bludgeoned to death with a pipe. The house was found unlocked, but all the shades were drawn and nothing had been taken. A man named Loving Mitchell was arrested, as well as a married couple, but the police chief in charge of the investigation didn't believe they actually did it. The next case occurred in Ellsworth, Kansas, in October of 1911. A family of five was killed with an axe that was wiped clean and left at the scene. The windows and telephone were covered with cloth, and a lamp was found without its chimney at the foot of one of the beds. Bloodhounds tracked a scent from the house to the crossroads of the railroad tracks, but lost it after that. The local marshal thought someone had also attempted to break into his home that same night, but failed. The next case occurred on June 5, 1912, in Paola, Kansas, just five days before the Velisca murders. A husband and wife were bludgeoned to death in their beds. The doors of the house were unlocked, but nothing was taken, and no weapon was recovered. The bodies were covered over in bedsheets, and a lamp with no chimney was found at the foot of the bed. The same night, another family in the area awoke to the sound of a lamp chimney falling. They witnessed a man fleeing the house through a window. After the Velisca murders on the 10th, there was a break of a few months before Henry Moore killed his grandmother and mother. Their house was ransacked, the axe used to kill them was hidden in a nearby ravine, and neither woman was found in bed, although they were in their pajamas. Moore only confessed to the last murder, and denied any involvement with the others. McClary still thought it might have been him, as the murders were committed after Moore was released from jail for forgery and stopped after he was jailed for killing his family. Moore staunchly denied any involvement, and I'm sure you've also noticed the differences in the murder he committed and the other five. But McClary seemed to be on to something with his serial killer theory. He was, however, mostly ignored at the time, though the papers did run with the story for a short while. McClary's theory was expanded upon by Beth Klingensmith, a computer programmer for a state correctional facility, in her 2006 seminar presentation, The 1910s Axe Murders, The McClary Theory. This paper details the murders that McClary linked together and adds a few more to the theory. In all the cases, the M.O. is very similar, and most of the locations are within a few miles of a railroad. Her paper was really well-researched and well-sourced, and Smithsonian Magazine wrote an article about it in 2012, continuing interest in the case 100 years after it occurred. Two other authors, Bill James and his daughter Rachel James, saw this Smithsonian article, read Klingensmith's work, and came up with a theory of their own, linking not only the cases McClary and Klingensmith tied together, but several more as well. They called The Mystery Killer and their 2017 book The Man from the Train, as they believed the killer moved from one target to the next via the railroads, 
choosing victims that fit a loose profile of families with female children, and using a convenient weapon that most families had lying around their small-town homes at the time. James and James believe they have pinpointed who the killer is. One of the earliest murders that fits the killer's M.O. occurred in 1897 with the murder of the Newton family in Brookfield, Massachusetts. A family with a young daughter was found bludgeoned to death in their beds inside a locked house. In this case, a hired hand named Paul Mueller was suspected but disappeared before he could be questioned. He was never found. James and James believe Paul Mueller is the serial axe murderer responsible for many murders in the United States, including Villisca. They also insinuate that Mueller might have committed another famous murder that occurred in Kaifeck, Germany, years after the Villisca murders. These are known as the hinter Kaifeck murders, and if you'd like me to do an episode on them, let us know. Klingensmith stated that the Paul Mueller theory is well-researched conjecture, which James and James say is fair, but their combined research does seem to indicate that a serial killer struck many times, including in Villisca. Who they were, we will never know for sure. The house where the murder of the Moore family and the two Stillinger girls occurred is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places and is called the Villisca Axe Murder House. For $10, you can tour the house which has been restored to its 1912 state by its owners, Darwin and Martha Lynn. They also offer overnight tours, which many a ghost hunter has taken advantage of. Paranormal activity is assumed, thanks to the grisly deaths that took place there, but not advertised. The Axe Murder House is one of the only things bringing people to the town of Villisca these days, as admitted by the owners. The town just sort of faded after the murders, this type of dark tourism is on the rise all over the world as people seek places of historical significance as well as thrill. The unknown and the frightening sparks a feeling of adventure, especially when the mystery has yet to be solved. Could modern forensics have solved this case were it around back then? Probably. It may even have prevented the murders in Villisca entirely by stopping the killer before they could strike again. But back then, forensics wasn't what it is today, and the identity of the person who killed the Moore family, and perhaps several other families, remains a mystery. The fact that a case so brutal will never be solved draws us like moths to flame. We want to unravel the mystery, and the fact that we can't only makes us more fascinated. That is why this case brings out our morbid curiosity. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating on iTunes. Your ratings help us become more visible and find more listeners. Thank you, Carl, for getting in touch via our website. Thank you to Catherine, Renee, Allison, Alan, Justine, Jordan, Wes, Kevin, and Crystal for your comments, questions, and shares on Facebook. Thank you to Carl, Andrew, and Joseph for recommending and advising us on Twitter. Thanks to you, the listeners. Our creepy community is growing, especially on Facebook, so head over there to engage with other listeners, discuss episodes, and share your creepy stories and cute pet pictures. Also, the MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. As I said before, if you like the show, why not support the MCP with a donation? Your gifts go to the research materials and other things we use to create this podcast. It's also a great way to show your love for the show. If you'd like to donate, you can go to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and click that donation button. On our website, you'll also find links to all our social media, links to our sponsors, and other ways to contact us. You can also support us by becoming a patron on Patreon. 
We have several tiers, the lowest being $1 per episode. Patrons get access to our patrons-only feed and will continue to receive away episodes when I'm not available at the usual time. This tier also makes you eligible for our new Fleet Street Meat Raffle, where we give away one Morbid-themed item per month to one lucky winner. Just go to patreon.com slash morbidcuriositypodcast to sign up and reap these rewards. We are eternally grateful for your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.